this video, I'd like to discuss polling and election day coverage, the impact that they have on campaign messaging and vice versa, the impact that campaign messaging can have on both of those areas. So uh, let's see, and let's start with polling. And uh, first of all, what is polling? What are we talking about here? Polling is just a survey instrument that we use to elicit opinions, attitudes, and personal information from individuals. So we're basically just asking people questions. How do you feel about this? Are you, are you, who do you think you're going to vote for? Those types of things. So it's just a series of, of questions that we ask about, usually about specific topics. So that's what we mean in general by polling. Now, in uh, specifically in campaign messaging and campaign communication, there are a couple different types of polls that are used. Let's start with the more general types of polls. Um, first of all, there are public opinion polls, exactly what they sound like. How do you feel about this? What's your opinion on this? Uh, will you support a candidate who, you know, feels this way about an issue or that way about an issue? Just asking the public, essentially, how they feel about a particular issue so we can get a handle on what issues are important to voters and things like that. We also have what we call push pulls. Polls. Now, these are a little more ethically gray, I guess, to, to put it kindly. Really, what a push poll does is kind of generate questions in such a way. Normally, polls are asked, you know, poll questions are designed to be neutral in order to not indicate, you know, you shouldn't know when you're asking, when you're answering questions in a poll. You really shouldn't know who's asking these questions. Is this for, you know, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, or just a news organization or whatever? Questions should be asked in a neutral way that doesn't give away what answer they want. Push polls are the opposite of that. They're pushing things. They want you to say things like, you know, they're going to ask questions in such a way that says, um, that gets you to try and support an issue, right? Uh, that, that, that gets you to, to try and answer the way that they want you to so that that poll will indicate the information in the way that they want it to. So polls can be skewed in that way as well, in that way as well. Something we need to be on the lookout for in terms of the use of push polls. Again, ethical organizations don't really use push polls, um, but you, you do see them frequently. Strong polls are basically just informal voting, such as they're just straight up asking, you know, who are you going to vote for? And we're getting a feel for who's going to vote for who and who, who may be ahead in what situation. Now, again, these are not, you know, binding votes or whatever, but at this moment, who are you going to vote for? What way are you going to vote on this issue? Uh, and so we have then straw polls, or what those are called. And finally, you have exit polls, which is where you actually ask people as they're leaving the voting place, do you mind if, you know, could you tell me how you voted? So we're getting a feel for what kind of support different candidates are getting. Um, now, again, not everybody answers these. So when we're going to talk about some of the problems with polling, but, you know, one, one problem is you may get one group of people who are willing to talk, who are all supporting one candidate, and the people supporting the other candidate don't want to talk about it, don't want to share their vote. So the exit polls can be skewed in that way as well. So, um, But basically, you're just asking people as they leave, how did you vote on this? Who did you vote for? Who did you support? Those types of things. There are also some, some different types of polls that political campaigns specifically use. Um, so first, we would have what we call a benchmark poll, which is basically you're, you're out there when your candidate is first getting out there saying, do you know who this person is? Do you support them? Would you vote for them? And so forth. Just to get an idea of where people stand with this person in general. Right? To establish that, um, sometimes these are called baseline polls. So you're basically just establishing a baseline of this is where we're at right as we get started. Uh, then throughout the campaign, you may issue what you call brush fire polls, where you're, you're kind of taking the temperature on different things, maybe on different issues. A lot of times you see this in use uh, in terms of favorable versus unfavorable. You know, do you or do you find this candidate, do you find their position favorable in this, you know, are they favorable in this position? Or are they favorable in that position or whatever? Do you prefer them over these other candidates? So these are taken sporadically throughout to kind of update where we're at on the benchmark. And then uh, you will oftentimes also see in larger campaigns, especially tracking polls where you have a specific group of people a lot of times, and they will track you know, on a much more regular basis, how are you feeling about the candidate today? Is your opinion Has your opinion gone up or down or so forth? And they'll track across a period of time with a specific group of people uh, how they're feeling about that candidate and use that as information too, using, you know, probably likely voters and different things. So anyway, so these are campaign, these are polls that campaigns are more likely to use then. They're used by news organizations and other people too, but um, these are the ones campaigns are a lot of times focusing on in terms of their specific candidate. You do find some common errors in polls. So when we're talking about these, some things we need to look for as we're examining polls and considering polls, uh, some common errors. Um, first of all, there's a margin of error built into just about every poll. They recognize that this isn't 100% accurate, so we need to know, especially if it's very close, we need to know what the margin of error is. If, a, if a, you have two candidates that are polling at 
you know, 49 and 46 percent and your margin of error is 5 percent, then you really don't know anything about that. I mean, that, that, that's saying that, you know, it's a margin of error. They're within three points of each other, but the margin of error is five points. So it could be anywhere in between there. You really, we just really don't know. So we need to understand and look for that in the fine print. What's the margin of error in this poll? And where did that place things in relationship to one another? We also need to think about uh, a non-response bias. You know, people are sometimes reluctant to respond to polls in general. So uh, these these polls tend to have very low response numbers. A lot of polls do. Most national polls have very low response numbers. Uh, so we need to understand that they're not getting a lot of participation a lot of times. So it could be uh, often in that sense. It could provide an error in, in the non-response bias. And then the response bias. You get some people who are so charged up and they, they want to respond in a certain way. They try and you know, think maybe they can push a poll in a certain way. And so they, they may... Um, overstate or even understate uh, their responses and so the, to try and manipulate the poll in that way so we have to understand that there's also a response bias in addition to a non-response bias non-response being people don't answer at all response bias being people when they do answer attempting to kind of push the poll in one direction or another then you also have wording issues again this comes in you know, when you when you have a push poll for example there's no wording issue because you're wording exactly how you want to in order to make the poll go your way but other times um, you're going to have wording issues in terms of a, a legitimate poll is going to be very careful in the way that they word things again they want things to be neutrally oriented but sometimes that's difficult to do so there could be wording issues in terms of pushing the, the respondents in one direction or another, or it could be that they just don't understand the language of the poll, don't understand the question, and so maybe they're not answering in a way that represents their true views. So there could be wording issues that create errors in polling as well. As far as election day coverage, some things we need to keep in mind about election day coverage, just a few notes here, that uh, election day coverage, first of all, remember that this is big business. This is a big day, for, for especially for news uh, channels and things. You know, we're talking about CNN, Fox News, things like that, uh, and, and really the networks as well, though. But but these they, they put a lot of time and energy into news election day coverage because they know a lot of people are going to be watching. And so that's big business for them. They're there to make money, and, and that's fair. So they're going to be able to sell a lot more advertisements. They're going to get a lot more eyeballs on their on their uh, TV screen or on their on their website or whatever. So so they understand that this is big business, and they push it in such a way that makes us feel like it's, it's really, uh, really, really important that we watch every bit of that coverage. There's also, remember, lots of speculative math. I mean, we really, truly don't know the, the outcome of any election. Uh, this year is no exception. We don't know the uh, outcome and for, we didn't know for several days, almost a week, right? But, uh, but even on a regular election cycle, when they announce winners on the night of, we don't really know them. Those votes aren't certified. So there's lots of speculative math going on here in terms of, okay, how, how many votes is this person ahead? How many votes are outstanding? What percentage of the, of the potential vote? And then, you know, uh, what's the possibility? You know, if, if the other person were to get all those votes, could they catch up or whatever? Or the, is there a big enough lead? So there's lots of speculative math going on here. We need to keep that in mind as well. That election day coverage involves a lot of speculative math based on voting and and participation and exit polling and different things like that so uh, nothing is over until it's over we need to remember that for especially when we're watching election day coverage and and also from a from a, a coverage standpoint that language matters we need to keep that in mind language matters um, there's a difference in, in the way that we word things that's going to give people the impression of you know this is too close to call is it too close to call because they're really that close like the, the candidates have almost an equal number of votes, or is it too close to call because there's just not enough, uh, you know, voting percentage in, and there's still, you know, lots of swing room here that it could go either way. Uh, we use a lot of these same phrases over, we hear a lot of these same phrases over and over in election day coverage, but we need to understand that the, the, even though that language may get a little repetitive, there's a big difference in some of that. Some of that's pretty broad, some of it's pretty abstract, and so we need to pay close attention to those types of things. There's, uh, you know, in election day coverage, there's this emphasis on national races, uh, specifically in presidential election years. There's this emphasis on uh, the presidential election as opposed to even other national races like the congressional races, Senate races. Those are equally important. Those are really important elections uh, that we want to track and we want to understand uh, because they're going to have a big impact. Uh, but we also need to know that, that, you know, a lot of governance happens at the state and local level. So we don't get a lot of coverage of those except from your local uh, TV outlets or, or uh, news outlets. 
Um, but there's a there's a lot happening at the state and local levels that that we can't ignore. We can't ignore just because there's a national race going on. We need to understand that that those aren't the only races. We need to from a from a receiving standpoint we need to uh, seek out that information and from a coverage standpoint we will also want to emphasize that information that it's not all about the presidential election in, in any year so uh, there's but there tends to be an emphasis on those national races one thing that, that we have understood and that we do understand about news coverage is that we want to be careful not to discourage voters and news outlets hopefully are being very careful about that because they start covering these things that you know polls close it five or six o'clock eastern time which is fine they start covering you know four or five six o'clock whatever eastern time but we want to make sure that people on the west coast who still have hours to vote aren't discouraged from doing so by by the news coverage saying oh well it looks like this is going to be a landslide you know and, and then the people on the west coast say well if it's a landslide then i don't need to go vote anyway right we don't want to do that we want to be careful in our coverage not to run the risk of discouraging voters from participating um, by the, because of the news coverage and because of election coverage, and, and not only because it, we want to encourage participation in our in our elections, but also because um, that could have potentially have an impact on those races. If if enough people don't show up to vote and and don't uh, come out and vote, that could potentially have an impact. There. So, so we need to understand fully. Uh, what our role is in terms of understanding polls, understanding polling, understanding election day coverage, and all those types of things. So uh, we just want to be vigilant with that and, uh, and be fully informed and fully aware of those types of things. If you have any questions, feel free to give me uh, an email. Shoot me an email. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about polling, about election day coverage, and provide any other resources that I can. Okay? In the meantime, again, let's be critical and, and, and uh, vigilant in understanding these things and understanding the role that they play in communication messaging and campaigning.